I'm yeah. here with Dr. McEnany at, you know, in, in New Mexico. And in addition to being the past AMA president, she's done some incredible things in New Mexico. And um, there's not enough time. We'd spend the whole time probably talking about New Mexico and the things you're doing in cancer care there. But maybe just start with just what would you tell people, you know, here in Arizona and elsewhere about what you've been doing in the last you know, time there in New Mexico and how you're approaching cancer care in a new way? When you're busy being sick with cancer or any other severe illness, you do not have the energy to manage the system, to fight with insurance companies to get what you need, to schedule your appointments, to negotiate your way through all the morass of healthcare systems. So our theory and that we built the practice around is all the patients should have to do is show up and sometimes they need help doing that. And so we tried very hard, and that was the basis of Come Home, was to follow patients, manage their cancer with them, make sure that they call us if they have anything, get to the office, provide the services that they need, provide all the services we can possibly give them, including helping indigent patients pay their bills of non-medical expenses, and so they can focus on getting well. If you need to be seen today, we see you today. If you need to have us organize things for your care, we organize that. If you need a fight with your insurance company, we say, you go take a nap, we'll fight with your insurance company. Our theory is that patients need to focus on getting well and not on the harassments of our healthcare system. And so we found a group of like-minded practices and we work together with them across the country to try to be able to deliver this level of care that just takes care of people, which is what people want when they're sick. What are you most excited about just in terms of new developments you know, that you're involved in looking ahead for New Mexico cancer care? Well, for New Mexico and for the country, the number of new drugs that have come out that offer hope and life and good quality life to patients makes this the most amazing time to be an oncologist. We can do so much for people that we could never do before. And the trick now is to figure out how to get it to everybody. That it's one thing to develop the drug, but we have to be able to get it to the patients who need it. And we have to be able to do it in a way that the country can afford to deliver it. And so we strongly believe that independent practices are the low cost, high quality alternative to large institutions that are bureaucracies that are hard to get care done in, that are often impersonal. We think that the independent practice needs to be preserved and it needs to thrive and it needs to be expanded so that people can get their healthcare locally and know that they're getting the best. We think that rather than aggregating practices into large vertically integrated systems, we need to democratize the information. We need to have a way to get the information to the doctor at the time when they need it so they can deliver that patient the best care, the same drugs that they would be getting if they went to one of the top tier research institutions. We need to participate in that research so the research reflects the patients we actually take care of. And we need to make sure that patients have access to 21st century, highest quality, most advanced cancer care and do it where they live. You know, I, as I think about this Inflationary Reduction Act and you know, my, I've been very, maybe my be focused in specifically as I'm a, I'm a cancer drug developer and currently developing a small molecule. And so I've been very focused on the impact just in small molecules. But if you think about IRA, how does that help or hinder the independent practice and the things you're trying to drive there to improve care? There is one part of the IRA that I like, and that is the $2,000 out-of-pocket cap for Medicare patients, because I take care of poor people. And the average person can put their hand on less than 500 bucks for an emergency. And guess what? Being told you have cancer is an emergency. So I like that out of pocket cap. I think that's fair. What I don't like is 
changing the delivery of the market, of the way drugs are developed and delivered to patients without carefully considering all of the downstream unintended consequences that could adversely affect patients. I'm very concerned about that. And our group, the National Cancer Care Alliance, is going to collect some actual data on this because doctors are all scientists as well, maybe not drug developer level of science, but we try. And we also like to have actual data to make decisions on. So what we are going to do is we are going to look into each of our individual practices and we are going to see which drugs are likely to be on that list and whether or not our current delivery system would allow us to continue to be able to buy those drugs from manufacturers and our distributors and be able to deliver those drugs to patients and stay in business at the same time. If this law arbitrarily cuts down the price of a drug to below the cost where I can afford to be paid for it, if they're not paying me what I paid for it, I will be out of business pretty quickly. And if the physician practices go out of business, first of all, hospitals may survive a little longer because the average chemotherapy bill in a hospital is 160% of what it is in a physician fee schedule practice. So they can probably survive a little longer, but not long enough. And if we have priced ourselves into a situation where we're getting paid less to deliver a drug than we bought the drug for, we're out of business and we'll stop buying that drug. And what that means is that cancer patients will not be able to get those drugs. And it's not just cancer, it's rheumatologic diseases, it's other serious illnesses, multiple sclerosis, other things that are gonna be affected. So it would, we are concerned that ultimately it will be the patients who suffer. So we are going to look in our practices as whether or not we can afford to continue delivering that drug under the Inflation Reduction Act, and whether or not there will be patients who are displaced, and if so, how many. And for those patients who will be dis displaced from our practices, is there an option in the area that they can get to? I think the government is assuming that the 340B funded hospitals will be able to, to take in this care. But I hate to tell you, but when I call the local university for an appointment, it's months to get in and cancer will not wait months. They, they are overflowing. We have a shortage of physicians in this country. And I don't care if you're a 340B hospital or an independent practice like mine. If you don't have a physician to see that patient, it doesn't matter what the payment process is. So they do not have infinite capacity to take care of all the people we're taking care of. So my fear with the Inflation Reduction Act is that the unintended consequences for the immediate delivery of care will be that there are drugs that we cannot afford to deliver to patients and that they are deprived of the opportunity to receive. And that is heartbreaking. Obviously, I have a lot of concerns about what this will do to the innovation that's going on. Yeah. Um, we are hoping to continue to work with clinical trials, but why would a manufacturer start a clinical trial for a new indication if that drug will not be on patent long enough for them to make back the costs of funding another multi-million dollar clinical trial. Uh, so I'm really concerned about the unintended consequences of this. And it is our plan to provide actual real world data, working with Amerisource Bergen, but we'll work with others as well to be able to say to our members of Congress, it sounded like a great idea. We would all like to have lower drug prices, but this is what is likely to happen in your district if this moves forward. I think the need for real data is huge. I mean, I had, you know, I had suspected Ira was hitting small molecules harder than biologics, just out fundraising for a small molecule company. And I was encouraged by AZ Bio and actually in talking to both the policy leaders of our Arizona senators to go get data. You know, it's like, 
and it's, it's like cancer, right? It's like a cancer trial. You, you know, you first get some anecdotes of a few patients, but it's, it's data you want to see. You want to see that phase one data, then your phase two data. And I feel like we're in a stage where we're starting, to, we have the anecdotes now, we're starting to get the phase one data of what the IRA, what's happening with IRA. And so when I, I surveyed 100 VC, um, VCs and basically six out of seven of them are pulling back from oh. small molecule development for the elderly um, and large populations. Which is, you know, so the data is starting to roll in, um, and so you, I mean, having your having your data would be will be super helpful, I think, to you know to make that case. But it's a shame we have to make the case after. And you know, do you, do you feel like you were part of the the dialogue? You know, you have so much expertise, you and your colleagues. Were you part of the dialogue in terms of how the when Ira was initially you know discussed? Was there a typical back and forth like you would get? You know, with you know, like with the FDA does something new, you have a certain period of time of months of review back and forth and dialogue. And I mean, there how, did, how no did that happen? Was any of that happen? What you're referring to is the usual proposed rule with a yeah. comment period and then a final rule comes out. And this bypassed that. And we're very upset with this because we didn't think it was studied well enough to be rolled out for the entire country and for, for one of the stellar industries in the United States where we are leading the world, you know, this is, I, I worry that we're handing it to the Chinese or others if, if we devastate our own industry here. But the biotechnology industry of the United States has been one of the, uh, one of the shining stars in, in what we do. And I'm worried about that. But no, there was no comment period. We had, we've had several of these occur. The, there was what we called the, the Part B experiment back in 2016, where they decided that they would change how physician practices are paid for these drugs. They're very worried that we select drugs based on the margin. We do live on that margin, but I hate to tell you, it isn't on Medicare. It's on the commercial drugs, because if I can break even on a Medicare patient, that's a good day for me in managing the business. And part of that is because the cost of infusing a drug in the office with all the regulatory requirements and OSHA and USP 800 and all the other regulatory things we have to do has far exceeded the Medicare payment. So what Medicare thinks is my profit on a drug actually goes to backfill the shortfall in the cost of delivering that drug to a patient. And if we break even, we're doing pretty well then. So we will start and we're already working on calculating how much it costs for us to deliver a drug, an intravenous drug or an injectable drug to a patient. So we're very interested in the small molecule market, particularly orals, because that's a, a great market. The problem with orals is we do all the work, we prescribe them, we educate the patient about them, we argue with the insurance companies for prior authorization, and then the large pharmacy benefit managers reach in and insist on doing the fill for that drug, play all of their, their unethical games with upping the price so they can get a rebate on the back end, and we do the work and they make a lot of money and patients pay more for it. That's not a sustainable system. So we have our concerns about the orals as well. And there will be some orals on this. This is part B and part D for this Inflation Reduction Act. And I personally think that they, that they missed the boat on looking at what is the easy way to lower drug costs. And that is to get rid of the middlemen in the market who add no value but are making huge amounts of profits. And here in New Mexico, our governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, appointed me to chair a drug task force, drug price task force. And so we wrote a long report back to her and passed the first part of our bill in the last legislative session. And we'll be going back to put work on the rest of the, of the bill to do significant reform of the pharmacy benefit manager industry so that if, for example, if they can negotiate a rebate, that rebate ought to go to the patient who's paying the bill at the pharmacy counter. And if the rebate is more than the patient's copay or coinsurance, 
it ought to go to the employer who is funding the premium that is being paid to the insurance company. Among other things, we have a long list of things we're going to put in into that bill. But that to me is the easy way to improve drug pricing for the consumer, for the patient at the end of the day, for the purchaser of the insurance plan, which is often the employer plus the patient, and be able to do that without disrupting the industry that is actually producing something, even though it, it will disrupt the profit margins of the pharmacy benefit manager industry. You're going to take the money from somewhere. I vote for taking it from them. I wish that's I could half, real vote. That's half the dollar spend and it's and there's it, it's almost no visibility in terms of where it goes. Um it's been it's pretty eye opening. You know, I'm just I just think about the drug development side, but um it's pretty eye opening the 50 cents on the dollar is going going to it, right. you know a group my year with, with no of accountability AMA, where it's actually going. My year of AMA presidency, it was merely 43%. That was 2018. Now, five years later, it's 50%. Do you feel, so ASCO is right around the corner. I mean, you've always in your career been, I've been far ahead of the curve in terms of policy and thinking about impact and, you know, and, and trying to get ahead of these things. What's going to, you know, are people talking about this at ASCO? How plugged in is the average oncologist to this? Are they aware of it? And, you know, what's the typical oncologist thinking about, about these, these impacts from well, IRA? I, unfortunately, I think the typical oncologist isn't even thinking about it. The typical oncologist is thinking about what do I do with Mrs. Smith and then Mr. Jones and then yeah. Mr. Yazi after that? And how do I get through the day? And how do I get my charts done? And and how, you know, and now they're worried about the shortage of drugs that are out there. It's like, I can't give cisplatinum. So what am I going to do? So they have their hands full just trying to take care of the patient in front of them. And I, I know that the folks at CMS and probably the folks at the major insurance companies are astounded to think that the average oncologist doesn't have a clue how much any of these drugs cost. They're not sitting there going, I'm going to pick drug X over drug Y because yeah. I make more money on drug X. Yeah. They don't have a clue whether they make money or lose money or come out even yeah. on a given drug. They just it's entirely don't. what's better for the patient, you know, what and what yes. data supports that decision. And when I tell people this is what that drug costs, I see jaws drop, you know, mm -hmm. because they truly don't know. And it isn't their focus. You know, so the whole theory of we're doing this just to to pack our pockets is is just so far from reality that that it just makes my head spin. Yeah. But ASCO gets it. ASCO understands. Good. We're working with the AMA to make sure that the AMA understands that this is going to be a problem. And previously, when it's been a problem, the AMA is has been willing to take the data and including when we had the Part B experiment where they were going to just chop the, the reimbursement for physician practices, we did a similar survey through the National Cancer Care Alliance, provided that data to the American Medical Association, who were able to, to go and show it to the powers that be at CMS who said, you know, we didn't, this is not our intention to dismantle the ecosystem of taking care of patients. And I think that was part of the reason that that backed down. So we're hoping that we will be able to, by providing real world data from real practices, talking about real people who will be affected by not being able to get these drugs and looking at the number of patients who will be affected, that we will be able to successfully get Congress to maybe make some modifications in that. I hope they keep the $2,000 out of pocket cap. You know, seniors living on a fixed income are making the decision of, am I going to, you know, live on the street and take this medicine? Or am I going to die earlier because I can't get a medicine that could buy me several more good quality years? In the richest country on earth, I think it is unconscionable that we put people in that situation. So I think. I hope they keep that part of it. I, I just think they would need to rethink how we're going to go about 
accurately pricing drugs so that they can be affordable for the patients, yet still have sufficient profit for the people who are investing in developing them, because we all believe in capitalism. You know, we know that people need to make a return on their investment. It doesn't have to be greedy, but it does have to be positive. <laughs> I just said my last question is, is there any rationale why you would punish the small molecules more than the biologics? Does that make any rational sense in terms of how this was, you know, thrown together? Well, you have me guessing as to the reasoning of, of the government here, which is always a dangerous thing. Um, <laughs> I think they just figured that it's harder to make the biologics than it is, and they're still struggling with what is a biosimilar? Is it like a generic or is it similar but not identical? Is it biologically identical? Should it be able to be substituted? They're confused by the biologics. You know, and, and interestingly, I was talking to uh, a person who leads one of the hemophilia associations and he assured me that those biologics are not just interchangeable drugs. If you're used yeah. to one, you have reactions when somebody arbitrarily gives you a new type yeah. of it. So they are not, it's like having biosimilar wine, right? Yeah. <laughs> they are not all the same. So I think it was just, they thought the small molecule market would be simpler because they don't understand the biosimilar market yeah. at all. And they it was interesting in my survey, I asked, I asked 100 of these VCs and other, other biotech CEOs, is, is small molecule drug, drug development considered risk, but less risky or more risky? And it, it was pretty much exactly the same. It's, it's, not, it's not easier, it's not harder. They're both, they're both hard. All of them are about one in 10 shots. Once you get in the clinic, you know, if you make it to the clinic, one in 10 shots of having a drug. So the risk profile is kind of the same. So. Um, um, right. And, and I think, I think frankly that, and I've said this to multiple manufacturers, I think pharma needs to do a better job of demonstrating where their money goes, how many drugs they spend doing research on that go nowhere that they get zero return, yeah. how much money they spend. There's always the direct to consumer advertising issue because that's what people see. You know, they see right. what's on television. So they think, well, if they're spending all that, we could just cut them and make them stop doing that, which actually would make my life easier. So I would love I'm that. Sure. <laughs> um, but though I have never had anyone come up to me and go, gee, I want lung cancer so I can have that great drug I saw on television. The ads but, aren't that good. Um, <laughs> but, but I think showing how much money is paid in research and development, very honestly, how much is paid in, in marketing processes? Mm -hmm. How much is paid, you know, just to keep the basic science part going? How much is contributed by the federal government? How much money do you have to raise to be able to get one drug all the way through the FDA and to market? Yeah. How much that drug is funding the other drugs that didn't make it there? Yeah. Um, I think that transparency would go a long way because right now for the general public, pharma is a black box. Magic comes out of it and they have no idea what goes into the process. And I think the, the country needs to understand that. So I would hope that we would be able to use this platform that we're forced on by the Inflation Reduction Act to be able to say, here's the data. Let's look at this transparently. Let's also look at the pharmacy benefit managers transparently. Yeah. You know, if they're coming to pharma and they're saying, uh, I want you to raise your price a thousand dollars a month and give me a thousand dollar a month back back channel rebate at the end of the day, and I'll charge the patient their copay or coinsurance based on that higher price, and I'll charge the person buying the premiums for the, your insurance that higher price. And my medical loss ratio goes up because I'm charging that higher price. So I get to put more money in my own insurance pocket. Maybe we should have a little more transparency along that line. Having said that, it's transparency is necessary, but not sufficient. We also have to have teeth to be able to afford, to be able to force people who are profiteering off this system to stop doing it. 
I really appreciate your comment, and maybe I'll wrap up with this, is that, you know, having the average American understand what drug development is and what it takes and what the failures are and how we spend our money. And, you know, if all of it is done in Boston and, and in San Francisco and in San Diego, I mean, there's no wonder that Arizona and New Mexico wonders, well, what's happening out there? And I, you know, it's, it's another reason why I'm so passionate about biotech in Arizona um, in New Mexico, about the kind of things you're doing with the National Cancer Care Alliance with clinical trials, these independent practices, you know, starting out of New Mexico, you know, and, until that is closer to patients and they see that until your neighbor actually works in drug development and isn't just a scary thing that happens in, you know, in a state if very, very far from you, you won't have that kind of understanding that, that you know, we're trying to develop drugs for, for, very, for very serious diseases and we're doing a really good job of it. Um, you know, but it but it doesn't come free. It takes it's very expensive to do, and it's very long, and there's a lot of failures. So it makes me a big pas passionate believer in what you're doing in New Mexico, and also what we're doing in here in Arizona to really bring biotech closer, you know, to to our constituents, to to these people that that need to to not have this be a you know an institution and a in an industry that they're not familiar with. I think you're exactly right, and I think that uh, rather than putting regulations in that will hogtie the industry and eliminate its ability to expand and grow, that we ought to look at this as a potential for growth industry. We ought to make sure that it's fairly priced, yeah. that everybody needs a margin, every business needs a margin, but we need to make sure that we're getting something in exchange for that margin, which is yeah. my main beef with the pharmacy benefit managers but not so much with pharma because i'm seeing the products that are being created i'm seeing the effects every day that it has on the well-being of the people that i take care of in the clinic dr McEnany, thank you so much and thank you for your time especially on a friday afternoon i know how long your days are and how many patients you see each day so thank you for this time and thank you for your thoughts really thank appreciate you. it take care